Hey guys, it's Robin, and I just wanted to take some time to chat with you all just briefly. I'm in my office as a licensed therapist. I often hear a common refrain, and if I can be a bit stereotypical, I gotta say, I often hear this from my ladies. One of the things I hear is, Robin, it feels like I'm the only one who's willing to work on our marriage. There are clearly some things that we need to do differently, and it feels like I'm the only one who comes up with a date night, or I'm the only one who says, come on, baby, we need to talk, or I'm the only one saying, let's go to a therapist. It feels like you are the only one who is putting in the work to make marriage happen. I often hear people say this to me. They'll say, and Robin, you know it takes two to make a marriage work. If both of us aren't working on it, it's not going to change. I actually have a comment to that, but I'm going to wait and I'm going to bring that up in a moment. Listen, I'm going to share with you my process when I'm working with people, period, whether it's couples or women, um, young people, whoever's in my office. I have a strategy that I use and my clients might not even realize I'm using this strategy on them. And so you are getting a behind the scenes look at how I formulate my sessions often. When someone is facing a really challenging time, there's a three part process that I take them through. I try very hard to make sure that I empathize with where they are. Second, I normalize what they are experiencing. And lastly, I strategize with them to help them get to where they want to be. So I empathize, I normalize, and I strategize. So when it comes to this topic, help. Somebody help me. I feel like I'm the only one who's willing to work on my marriage. I am going to take you through that three-part process, okay? I want to empathize first with you. Hear me. I can only imagine how exhausting emotionally, um, mentally, for some people even spiritually, maybe even physically, it can be to feel like you are the only one willing to do what it takes to make the marriage work. Listen, marriage is work. It's probably next to parenting the hardest work you can do, but it really is the most rewarding work. And so I can only imagine what it feels like if you're the only one putting forth effort. You're the only one trying to do something. You're the only one um, looking things up, trying to figure out what needs to happen. If you're the only one doing that, or at least you feel like you're the only one doing that, y'all, I get it. I can imagine how draining that is. I can even imagine how sometimes you might feel um, hopeless, like wondering, is this really going to change? Listen, you don't have to admit it, but you might even be thinking, is this worth it? Listen, I understand and I don't want you to think that your efforts are going to go unnoticed. I don't want you to think that the work you're putting in isn't going to reap a harvest. I don't want you to give up. Here's the reality. I'm not in your home. I'm not in your marriage. So I don't know all of the ins and outs, all the nuances. And let's just keep it real. Because if you connect with me at any point, you know that I say all the time, I'm going to give it to you straight, no chaser. If you don't know what that means, basically, I'm going to keep it real. Listen, people do get divorced. We know that that's the reality. People do get divorced. And so when I just said, I don't want you to think that the work you're putting in isn't going to reap a harvest. You might be thinking, but Robin, what if I put in all this work and my marriage doesn't last? I'm still telling you, if that were to happen, stay connected to us and I'm going to help you make sure that it doesn't. But if that were to happen, I'm still telling you, if you are putting in the work from a heart place, from a God place, then the seeds that you're sowing will reap a harvest. So I want to empathize with you. I want you to know I understand. And it is difficult. It is hard. You know, in my, in my world, I tell my husband all the time, baby, you're going to let me have my pity party. Give me a minute to have my pity party. Just give me a little time to say, whew, this is tough, whatever the it is. And so I'm not one of those people who are going to tell you, suck it up. Act like it doesn't bother you. Be okay. No, give yourself a moment to just say, this is hard. This is tough. 
All right. So I'm telling you, I get it. Are you the one who feels like I always got to do all the work in my marriage? Number one, I get it. Now, I want to normalize something for you. So in other words, I want you to understand something. This might surprise you, especially to my sisters, to any of those brave men who are watching me. If this is you, what I'm about to say is a bit stereotypical. So just bear with me. But ladies, this might surprise you, but I want to normalize something for you. In my own marriage, in the marriage of some of my closest friends, even in the marriages of the people who I see as mentors, nine times out of 10, 90% of the time, most of the time, it's the wife who's doing a lot of the initiation for the marriage enrichment. Not that the wife is the one who's doing all of the work for the marriage. That's not always the, the uh, deal across the board. But even in my own marriage, I often am the one who initiates a lot of the marriage enrichment. I might say, hey, babe, I found this book that I think we need to read. Thank God my husband says, okay, cool. You know, what's the plan? When do we need to have it read by? Or most of the time, I'm the one saying, babe, we need to go to this conference, this, this retreat. Or I'm the one saying, baby, you got to watch this YouTube clip. I think it'll really help us. I'm the one who's initiating it. Now, again, thank God he goes right along with me. Actually, I got to say this. Shout out to Lee May. Just this week, I got an uh, email from him about a marriage conference he wants us to go to. But y'all, we've been married 15 years. That was the first time he initiated a marriage conference. So I'm sharing that with you because a lot of times if you begin to realize, oh, like that's kind of what happens. That's kind of the norm. Sometimes it helps you to feel better about it. Maybe that's just me. When somebody tells me, Robin, yes, this is kind of what normally happens. Think about somebody that you think is a strong relationship or you think it's a, a positive and healthy relationship. If you were to find out, oh, this is kind of what happens. It kind of helps to ease some of the frustration. Because see, some of y'all might be thinking other husbands are doing all of this marriage work and this marriage enrichment. So I hope that helps you a little bit. If I normalize that for you, a lot of times, ladies in particular, we are the ones who come up with the idea or put the plan in place. And honestly, it's not that the husband doesn't think that it's important. A lot of times they're just not plugged in in that way. Quite mm -hmm. frankly, a lot of times it's that um, they're not even wired to think that way. And so you could decide today to stay frustrated that you're the one who's having to do it. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you could decide why do I keep having to do it? But if your husband is on board and he participates and he gets engaged, then be okay with being that person. Now to my fellows, if you're telling me, Robin, no, I'm the one who has to initiate all the time. I want you to recognize if you are initiating and your wife is okay with being a part of that, be okay with it. So I've kind of empathized with you. Hopefully you get that. I understand that it can be difficult. I've tried to normalize, help you to understand. Listen, if you are the one who's, who's constantly feeling like you're the one having to initiate and work on it, then that's okay. It's okay. Be okay with that. But now let's strategize. This is where it gets a little tough. Okay. Number one, particularly for my sisters again, but fellas for you as well. Number one, I want you to think about this. This is a hard one. Gosh. Ladies, a lot of times we got to keep it real. If you feel like in your marriage, you're the one who is always having to do the work. You're always having to initiate. And you've heard me and you've said, Robin, you said that your husband just go ahead and gets on board and you're okay with it. But Robin, my husband won't get on board. When I initiate, when I suggest, Robin, we're in a bad place. And when I'm suggesting counseling, he refuses to go to counseling. When I'm saying, let's read this book, he laughs at me. When I'm saying, let's go to this conference, he says, no way. Maybe husband, you're saying, my wife won't even talk to me anymore. So she's definitely not on board. I want you to consider this. Okay, this is what I said is a little tough, but I want you to consider this. If you follow the work I do at any level, you know that I always say, you got to start with the man or the woman in the mirror. You have got to ask yourself the tough question. Have you created a void in your marriage where your spouse no longer can really hear you. Have you, by your actions, by what you say, created a void, created a filter, created a space 
where your spouse won't hear you. And maybe that's why your request for marriage enrichment, your request to do things to help the marriage, maybe that's why your spouse isn't responding. You have to be courageous enough to tell yourself the truth. Let me give you an example of that. Um, my husband and I have been together 24 years and we've been married 15 years. And over the years, my personality, a part of my personality has created a void where it's difficult for him to hear me on one certain area. Well, maybe a lot of areas, but this particular area, you know, I tend to be a little bit dramatic, right? Maybe a lot dramatic. And so over the years, when there was something going on, I would get really worked up about it. Or I would say, oh my God, baby, this is a big deal. We need to really focus on this. Listen, this is huge. Do, baby, are you, this is huge. Well, because I would do that so much, and in his mind, it wasn't as huge as I was making it. He felt like, Robin, that's just too much. You're doing too much. It started to happen that when I would say something that really was important, my husband would minimize it because I was making everything important. I wasn't being careful about how I engaged. I was making everything a big deal so that he had to start dealing with that by saying, mm-mm. Robin, you're doing too much. And so when it was something that we really needed to pay attention to or we really needed to focus on, I had created a void where he couldn't hear me. And I had to do the work to rebuild that connection. Quite frankly, we're still working on that. I'm still working on saying, baby, I know. I know that I'm over the top and I know I make things a big deal, but I'm serious. This one right here, we really need to be able to pay attention to it. So I want you to ask yourself. Have you created, when you're thinking about marriage and ritual, when you're thinking about help, Robin, my spouse is not interested. I'm the only one that's working on the marriage. When I bring things up, my spouse doesn't respond. You have to ask yourself the tough question. I've empathized with you. I have even normalized it for you. And now we are strategizing. This is the first strategy. Ask yourself, have I created a void where my spouse can't hear me? One of my really good girlfriends says that the way she has created a void is that she is very sensitive to people who are in their circle. And so she says that when somebody new comes around, she's telling her husband, uh-uh, we can't trust them. Nope, can't trust them. Look out for them. So now with her husband, anybody who she says look out for, he's like, baby, you think we should look out for everybody. So if I listen to you, we won't have anybody in our life. She has created a void where her husband can't hear her. I'm just trying to help you to ask yourself, is there a place, is the reason why when you ask your spouse to go to counseling, do they shut down? Because over the years, over your time together, the way you have presented that, how you've engaged with them has created a void, created a filter, created a disconnect where they can't hear you. That's strategy number one. I want you to ask yourself that. Here's strategy number two. I want you to ask yourself a question that guides everything that I do. I ask myself this question. Robin, what do you want the most versus what you want right now? Robin, what is it that you want the most versus what you want right now? Here's a silly example I give all the time. What I want the most is to, <laughs> to lose some weight. That's what I want the most. I'm just keeping it real. But what I want right now, some Pillsbury chocolate chip cookies with some milk. What I want right now is some Pillsbury chocolate chip cookies with some milk. But Robin, what do you want the most? Well, what I want the most is to lose weight. So if I focus on what I want the most versus what I want right now, there will be some change in my life. Help me make some change in my life. I want you to ask yourself that question for your marriage. When you are saying, Robin, I'm the only one who's willing to work on my marriage. And I just don't think it's fair. Why do I keep having to do the work? I want you to ask yourself this question. What do you want the most versus what you want right now? I know right now you want your spouse to initiate marriage enrichment. I know you want your spouse to respond positively. I know you want your spouse to do something different, but I want you to ask yourself, what do I want the most versus what I want right now? What you want the most is for the two of you to be connected. 
What you want the most is for the two of you to be engaged with one another. Maybe what you want the most is for the two of you to end up in marriage counseling. You're like, I want us to get in counseling. So stop focusing on what you want right now, which is for them to make the initiative. Focus on what you want the most. Take your mind off of why do I keep having to be the, the one? Why do I keep having to be the one? And focus on what it is you want. Now, hey, y'all, I see y'all commenting. Um, remember I said at the top of this Facebook Live, I said, people often tell me, Robin, if two people aren't working on the marriage, it takes two to make it work. And if two people are not working on the marriage, it's not going to turn around. And I gave y'all a little look. I would like to suggest that you challenge that mindset. Pastor Forrester, uh, Reverend Forrester, Counselor Forrester is on this uh, Facebook Live right now, and she can attest to this because she works with couples as well. I want you to challenge that mindset because one of the things I know for sure is that while ultimately it does take two to make a marriage work, I am telling you, if at least one of you will begin to do the work, if one of you will begin to have a heart change, if one of you will begin to have a mind change, if one of you will start communicating with the other differently, if one of you will start changing some things and, and working on some things, I can tell you, I have seen it happen time and time again, your marriage can be shifted. Your marriage can change. So I want you to challenge that mindset that it has to be two. One of you could begin to turn the tables. One of you can shift the dynamics in your marriage. Let me tell you, ladies, especially the ladies who are looking at this, I'm telling you right now, one thing I know for sure, there is power in a woman's prayers. You start praying for your marriage. You start covering your husband. You start loving him the way he needs to be loved. I'm telling you, you can begin to change it. So ask yourself, I know you are the one. I know you're the one who keeps feeling like you're having to do all the work. But ask yourself, what do I want the most versus what I want right now? Okay, here is the last one. So remember, we empathized. I normalized. Now we're strategizing. The first strategy was you got to ask yourself, where have you created a void? Where have you talked so much, done so much that you've called, caused a disconnect and your spouse can't even hear you? Secondly, ask yourself, what do I want the most versus what I want right now? And here's the last one. What can I do differently? If what you have been doing isn't working, what can you do differently? What, let me ask you this. This is a better question. What are you willing to do differently? You know, when I am speaking to couples in a, at a speaking engagement or something like that, I do this little um, exercise and I give, for instance, the husbands seven things that typically men say are important to them in their marriage. And so I have the husband to rank those seven things in order of importance. And then I have the wives to rank those seven things in the order that they think their husband is going to do. So in other words, is your husband going to put this as number one? Is he going to put this as number two? It never fails. They do that exercise. When they exchange lists, they find out that the wife has been thinking that this is number one on her husband's list when really this is it. Why am I sharing that? Because you might be thinking that you've done everything that you can do to help improve the marriage, but have you stopped and asked your spouse what you can do? Have you stopped and said, honey, what, what is it that you need? Baby, where am I missing the mark? What is a need that you have that I haven't fulfilled? What can you do differently, husband? What can you do differently, wife, that could begin to shift the dynamics of your marriage? What can you do and what are you willing to do differently? Hey, guys, I know, I know that, again, marriage takes work. And I know that it ain't for the faint at heart. But I also know, y'all, it can be the greatest gift that God has given you. I just want you to consider, number one, what have you done that has created a void? Number two, what do you want the most versus what you want right now? And then number three, what can you do and what are you willing to do different? You know, as I started this conversation, I know a lot of times we want somebody just to stick at the empathize stake. Excuse me. You want somebody to stick? We want them to stick at the empathize stage. We want them just to stay right there. Just empathize with me. But y'all, that 
that doesn't do us any good. Remember, I told you, I feel like you got to let it out. You got to let yourself feel what you feel. Get it out there. But you can't stay there. You got to decide that you are willing to move from where you are to where you want to be. And if you are looking at this, if for some reason God allowed you to get even this far in this video, maybe, just maybe, he's going to allow his Holy Spirit, his power to rise up in you in a supernatural way, in a way that you can't do on your own. Maybe, just maybe, he is going to shift your mind so that you can experience something different. And I'm just excited thinking about it. I think it's time for you to experience something different in your marriage. So wait, before I go, I want you to click on the link above. Those are, that is a PDF I've put together. It is 15 ways, 15 fun, easy, and quick ways that you can connect with your spouse. And I want to challenge you. I want you to try those 15 strategies. And I want you to come back and let me know how it goes. I can already tell you when you download it, click on um, the link above. I am going to try strategy number seven tonight. I'm going to try strategy number seven tonight. So I want you to click on that link and download it yourself. And let's see if we can connect even more intimately with our spouses. All right. I enjoyed chatting with you guys. I'll be here again soon. Y'all be blessed. And here's to healthier marriages. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Nephi, for joining. Pastor Lorraine. I think I saw Lakeitha on here. Thank you guys for joining me. I will see y'all next time. Bye.